All right. Hello, everyone. Thank you all so much for joining us. This is Left Bank Books and a Public Space welcomes award-winning author Ian Lee, who will discuss her new book, Tolstoy Together, 85 Days of War and Peace with Ian Lee. Uh, tonight, hopefully, uh, Lee will be joined by New York Times bestselling author Ianna Mathis. We are still waiting for Ianna to appear, but the show will go on. Left Bank Books is St. Louis's oldest independent bookstore. We would like to thank all of our supporters, the supporters of Yi and Lee and Ianna Mathis and a public space, and everyone for their outpouring of love for our bookstore. <coughs> Excuse me. Uh, we offer in-store shopping, curbside pickup, and delivery to anywhere in the country, anywhere in the world. Oh. <coughs> Excuse me. Let me take a little sip. We are very happy to be able to bring our event series virtual. We believe that events are a way to expand your mind and bring in new thoughts to make the world a better place. We hope that you enjoy this event, and we hope that you support Left Bank Books by purchasing a copy for you or for all of your friends at left-bank.com. It's a beautiful book. Purchasing a copy of the book from Left Bank Books allows us to keep our bookstore and staff operating, and it allows us to keep this event series going. So thank you so much for your support. I am Shane Mullen. I'm the events coordinator for Left Bank Books. I help produce our hundreds of author events each year with a fantastic team here in St. Louis. We will be taking questions from you, the audience, at the end of the event, towards the end of the hour. So you can type your questions as a comment, and you can do that at any point in time throughout the event. And be sure to follow Left Bank Books on Facebook and YouTube to be notified about all of our fantastic virtual events. And now about tonight's book, Tolstoy Together, 85 Days of War and Peace with Yi and Lee. From the acclaimed author of Dear Friend, from My Life I Write to You, in New York Life, a book about the art of reading. In Tolstoy Together, 85 Days of War and Peace, Yian Lee invites you to travel with her through Tolstoy's novel and with fellow readers around the world who joined her for, for an online book club and an epic journey during a pandemic year. I found that the more uncertain life is, Yian Lee writes, the more solidity and structure War and Peace provides. Tolstoy Together expands the epic novel into a rich conversation about literature and ways of reading with contributions from Garth Greenwell, Elliot Holt, Carl Phillips, St. Louis's Carl Phillips, Tom Drury, Sarah Majka, Alexandra Schwartz, and hundreds of fellow readers. Along with Yi and Lee's daily reading journal, and a communal journal with readers' reflections, with commentary on craft and technique, historical context, and character studies, Tolstoy Together, 85 Days of War and Peace, includes a schedule and framework providing a daily motivation companion for Tolstoy's novel and a reading practice for future books. Carl Phillips says, among the many pleasures of the hashtag Tolstoy Together group, while life has often felt on pause, which has which has ups and downs to it. Seeing how much we've read reminds me I've been traveling all along and not alone. Joyce Carol Oates says, a public space initiated a communal reading of Tolstoy's War and Peace under the aegis of the novelist Yi and Lee with the intention of lifting spirits and establishing a common bond among lovers of good literature. And Ann Patchett says, the brilliant novelist Yi and Lee has started a War and Peace book club online at a public space. You read 12 pages a day of War and Peace and a whole community of readers, and the next thing you know, you have read the book, and the pandemic is over, and you have read War and Peace, which is terrific. And now about tonight's speakers. Ian Lee is the author of seven novel, seven books, including Where Reasons End, which received the Penn Jean Stein Award, the essay collection, Dear Friend, From My Life I Write to You in Your Life, and the novels, The Vagrants and Must I Go. She is the recipient of a MacArthur Fellowship, Guggenheim Fellowship, and Wyndham Campbell Prize, among other honors. A contributing editor to a public space she teaches at Princeton University. Anna Mathis is a graduate of the Iowa Writers Workshop and is a recipient of the Missioner Copernicus Fellowship, 
The Twelve Tries of Hattie was her first novel. And A Public Space is an independent nonprofit publisher of an eponymous award-winning literary arts and culture magazine and a public space books. Under the direction of founding editor Bridget Hughes, since 2006, it has been their mission to seek out overlooked and unclassifiable work and to publish writing from beyond established confines. We are very happy to have them as our co-host this evening. And now, without further ado, would you please help me in welcoming our fantastic guests for the evening, Yian Lee and Bridget Hughes. Hello. Hi, Shay. Hi. Thank you for that wonderful introduction. Thank you. We have a fantastic crowd here this evening. I am certain that they will have a lot of questions for the audience Q&A at the end. And I'm certain that they're really looking forward to this conversation. I am as well. So I'm going to pass this off to you. Excellent. Thank you so much, um, Shane, for the introduction and all of the amazing people at Left Bank for hosting this event tonight. It's wonderful for us to be gathered with all of you in St. Louis, if only virtually. Um, and I am thrilled to have the chance to talk with Ian Lee and I hope also Ayanna Mathis, two extraordinary writers, readers, and dear friends to a public space um, to discuss Tolstoy together war and peace, and the joy of life as readers. Um, last year, as Shane said, at the start of the pandemic, a public space hosted a book club, open to everyone to read War and Peace over 85 days, a quarter of the year, um, and of quite a year. During that period, and with the series of book clubs that we followed, that followed, we often talked about this way of reading together as an experiment, and an experience. Um, we often thought of it as, as nourishing as if you were reading with a close friend sitting around a table at a cafe, but we were really reading with thousands of readers scattered across six continents um, and reading sort of in isolation, but together each day. So when we started to put this book together, we were trying to come up with a description for what it was. And at a public space, we often talk about the work that we're drawn to publishing in the magazine and with the books as uncategorizable, um, which felt very much the case here. But the experiment was that everyone had contributed their thoughts, observations, questions. Um, and it was a little bit overwhelming because it felt like that many people it could verge on chaos. But in fact, it turned into this sort of wonderful cacophony. Um, and so we started to talk about Tolstoy together as a communal reading journal. It is an oral history of how to read, as E. Yun described it. And as Garth Greenwell described it, um, it's a book about devotional reading. So E. Yun, I was hoping tonight that we could talk about all three of those aspects and also weave in some of the conversation from the Encore Book Club to read War and Peace that is going on right now, which you are hosting on a public spaces social media at the moment. But I thought to begin, I might ask you about something that you said recently um, to describe Tolstoy together in an interview. You said it was a way to read collectively, but not judgmentally or conclusively. And I wonder if you could just talk a little bit about those three qualities. Right. So thank you, Shay, and thank you, Left Bank. And yes, to read collectively, not judgmentally, not conclusively. I. I was very aware, you know, last year, and also I'm aware this year, our reading, our book club is a different, it's a little bit different than, you know, traditional, conventional book club where a group of readers, you know, read a book and then they come together at the end of the book, they discuss the book. And I have attended some of the book clubs. Oftentimes it's, it's sort of like, case closed we're going to talk about what we love about this book where we don't understand what we but you know i think the i think the reader's mind is made by the end of the book which is lovely but i think that with a with a book like war and peace because it's a long book and because it can be read slowly you know 10 to 15 pages a day i think there it's this lovely thing about not knowing where we're going, but knowing we're going somewhere. And 
also with thousands of other people. We're all following the same journey. And so I, I think that's the collectively part, the, coll the reading collectively part of the, the book club is, you know, we're all focusing on the same 10, 15 pages. Nobody's going to give a spoiler from, you know, 200 pages down the way. And sometimes we do talk about yesterday, but it's more about we're sharing today's, you know, our impressions or just thoughts that don't have to be final thoughts. We don't have to give a final word about what we read, just to share the thoughts. So that's sort of very lovely. And and I think because of, you know, this temporal, like just 10 to 15 segmented, second segment of reading, we really don't have to talk about it. I mean, sometimes we do, but I think our focus is really on many different things rather than the big picture or big theme. And so, so each reader, you know, brings in his or her own interest and attention, and we all pay attention to different things. And sometimes we pay attention to the same thing, and that's sort of very lovely. So, so that I think is sort of the spirit of this book, and the spirit of our reading together is. Really, we're just, you know, we're just taking a walk together. Sometimes you see a bird and I see a mushroom and we can just share that, that joy of seeing something. I love that. <laughs> you can also decide the next day that maybe you will pay attention to the mushroom and not the bird today. That's, yes, I think that's exactly right. Because sometimes, like I was talking, I was listening to the Brooklyn Book Festival when, you know, Laura, as Spencer said, she paid a lot of attention to sensorial and sensual details, physical details. And today's reading, I actually did think, I'm just going to pay a little bit more attention to physicality of, of the page. So it's, it's lovely, yeah. I was thinking one of the things that this experience in this book made me realize um, is that our individual understanding of a book, of a story, of a poem varies so wildly depending on who we are and the experiences and the perspectives that we bring and in a way what our blind spots are which is a word that i know we talk about often in the context of writing mm -hmm. um, and i wonder if you think that part of the experiment of Tolstoy together with all of these perspectives of hundreds of people contributed to understanding the novel so i want to say like spherically instead of instead of linearly and yes. that exercise in that way and seeing one's own blind spots? That is such a good question. I actually think the biggest, I think the biggest learning about myself after reading last year is I realized what my blind spot is as a reader. You know, I, I think when I write, I try to be conscious of my blind spot. And I always tell my students, you know, a writer's blind spot is just as big as her ego, so or his ego. So I'm I'm very conscious of just making sure my ego in writing can be as small as possible, as you know, invisible as possible. So I don't have a blind spot in writing, but I do have a blind spot in reading, which I actually did not know until I started reading *War and Peace* last year with all these readers. You know, my my in my interest is always in Pierre, so. I think it was just judgmental, you know, speaking of reading not judgmentally, I probably, for all the readings I've done myself, I was always judgmental towards uh, Prince Andre. I also, I just, I just made up my mind not to like him. And of course, you know, the novel was 1200 pages, offer plenty of opportunities for me not to like him. And so, I think that is the probably was the biggest blind spot of mine when I was reading War and Peace. And last year with all these readers, I think people really talk about things that I, for instance, I did not pay attention to was, you know, he could be prickly, but he could be shy too. There was the moment that when he kept, well, when he kept people at a distance, it was actually, there was that yearning to be close, but because Either he's shy or he's just not able to get closer to other people. I think 
I w- it was an illuminating experience when that was pointed out to me. I thought, well, I really read him with a blind spot. So this year I tried to read with a more open mind. And I have seen all these lovely things with him. Yeah. Um, I wonder, maybe I can ask you a few questions about the book club, sort of reading the novel this year with Tolstoy together, with both Tolstoy together the book, with this new community of readers, and War and Peace. So in a sense, you're sort of having three conversations almost. Um, so Tolstoy Together is divided into 85 chapters or 85 days of reading War and Peace. And each chapter is organized around specific chapters in the novel. So you can read them side by side. You can read Tolstoy Together side by side with War and Peace. But you can also open the book almost at random and find a theme or an insight or a question um, and select one among the multitudes to guide your reading. Um, so I'm just curious if there are certain comments, certain moments in Tolstoy together in the book that have that you've thought about in these first two weeks of of the of the book club reading that we're doing now. Yes. So we are at day fifteen today, which is one seventh into the into the eighty five days of journey. And you know, I if if there are first readers in the audience, I won't give away you know the the future plot with spoilers. But just in the past two weeks, I would say once again, I'm. I said I think we said uh, several friends on Twitter. We said reading Tolstoy together. You know, the hashtag Tolstoy together could be also called rabbit holding together. It is really a fabulous experience of everybody is looking at at different things i think richard you know i don't know if richard uh Gordilic is in the audience but he has this lovely curiosity about words that he he just well he just decides to be interested in the word and he would give a history of the word where an object for instance today he gave the pictures of the snuff box and then he said, you know, there were a lot of snuff. He, he, he put a little, a few pictures and then he talked about the snuff boxes, you know, in, in, in Vasile, I think. And then uh, in Louvre. And then he said something fascinating to me. He said, you know, in the future, I would have this, you know, where's my snuff box? It was in the couch. It's almost as like a sort of like a mini play to me. It's like a, it's a, it's a play that he made up for the audience. And a lot of us would join to enjoy this. And that's the same for many different readers. And someone noticed the fabric, for instance, and the, the clothes. I, I'm a blind reader. I mean, I do, I, do read for, I do read for plot and characters. I sometimes miss what the characters put on. But one of our designer friend who paid attention to Boris' mother's uh, clothes it's re-dyed silk gong and she just that re-dyed i have read the novel 15 times and i missed that that word re-dyed until you know a friend pointed out so i think for i i think in the past two weeks or you know this round and the last round i said something the other day i think when we were launching the book i said you know this is a this is a experience of reading miscellaneously I, I think it's just everybody has some sort of interest. We are sending out hundreds of people, you know, with their curiosities. I, I, I truly believe, you know, a hundred people's curiosities are always more interesting than my own curiosity. So I am more curious at this moment about what other people are reading and what other people are seeing. Did I answer your question? It's <laughs> a very yeah. long answer. No, it was a, it was a multi pronged question. Is this sort of a multi pronged uh, experience? Yeah. Say, if that's if that makes sense. Right, and and for instance, I you know we talk about uh, St. Louis friend, our friend Carl Philip. Last year in on um, on this day, you know we, we already passed that day, so I can read it. I think it's about the war. <sighs> Which, which page? Sorry, let me just, I marked the page and then of course I m- missed the page. 
So in 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 day I think it's day fourteen. Day fourteen. No. I think yesterday's day fourteen. But let me just read Carl Phillips yesterday's uh, tweet. Last night he, he tweeted because we just finished a big part about war, and he tweeted in the Iliad, which Tolstoy loved. Homer always reminds us that the gods are the true agents of war. Tolstoy's depictions reveal the utter humanness of war and seem to say there are no gods. I don't know why, but when when Carr pointed that out, I think it's it will be forever for Carr Philip to make that connection between Homer and Tolstoy, which I somehow I just missed. Last year he made the same uh, observation that the, the way Tolstoy so like described military often used nature as you know as part of the connection, and Carl Phillips said you know that's what Homer did in Iliad. So that kind of you know comparative reading or sort of I I, I would think it's comparative reading is really you just need all these brilliant readers to I don't know just to go on and gather these things and bring them back to our tea party tea party is the wrong <laughs> analogy but just to bring back to us so it's just lovely I love that phrase um utter humanness utter humanness I like that's what that was one of the themes that that we circled back to sort of throughout throughout Tolstoy together and looked at the different ways that Tolstoy captures all the layers of our utter humanness. Yes. Um, well, no, I want, I was going to, I'm, I'm, I'm going to make you answer uh, a question that I had wanted to ask Ayana. Mm -hmm. um, she, she hosts a series of interviews at Columbia University with artists. And last year she interviewed the filmmaker Dee Reese and she said something that I've been thinking about since then in the context of Tolstoy. And this is what Dee Reese said. She said, profiles don't lie somehow. And she was talking about a character's face and profile. You know, that someone's eyes could be smiling at you while they want to stab you in the back. And that there's a stillness to the profile, I guess. Um, and Ayana has a comment in Tolstoy Together about Tolstoy's detailed and intimate descriptions of faces. And she mentioned something that Charles Baxter has said, that we don't describe faces enough in our current literature. Um, and I wanted to ask her, but and I also will now have the <laughs> pleasure of asking you, when is it, when do you feel when you're writing it's important to describe a character and for what purpose? Wow, I wish I were Ayana because I, I wish I could be as brilliant as Ayana to answer this question. When do I, well, <laughs> I, I, when do I describe people's characters' faces? Now I feel very conscious that I don't do that enough. And, and for a reason, I think, I feel conscious, you may be self-conscious if I describe a character's face. But then if I can turn to Tolstoy, I think he's, well, one is, I mean, I have to say Tolstoy was fabulous in that he really loved himself, right? So that is, you know, we cannot compete with Tolstoy because he really loved himself. When he was young, he spent hours just gazing at himself in the mirror. I mean, just that fascination with his own face. I found that very lovely. But it showed because if you look at Tolstoy's characters, War and Peace, for instance, in the first two weeks, almost everybody looked into the mirror at herself or himself. You know, Boris walked, Boris walked past the mirror and sort of adjust his uniform. And Vera, Vera walked past the mirror, you know, adjust the scarf. And Natasha looked at the mirror. Everybody looked at the mirror, but I love that when Pierre looked into the mirror, he's not looking at himself he's looking at other beautiful ladies you know their reflection in the mirror so i, I think I, I i think i always imagine that's the kind of the description of faces i would like to write is a character watching someone else's face rather than me 
the author describing someone's face. And I think it's harder for me to describe a face just for whatever reason. But if I would say I steal one thing from, from Tolstoy, it's always one character watching another character. You know, the moment you set people watching each other, it's, it's just drama and interesting. You know, they don't even have to talk. They can just watch. There's a chapter in Tolstoy Together that from, from our this week of, of reading War and Peace about one of the characters, Bilibin. And <laughs> he's known primarily through the wrinkles. <laughs> this chapter in Tolstoy Together is all about the descriptions of the wrinkles. And in that chapter, one reader says, what does he look like? What does Bilibin look like? I can't see it. And I was thinking that the, the when Tolstoy describes a character, it isn't to tell us what they look like. It's it's the way he uses, you know, if it's Pierre's eyes or Bilibin's forehead or Elaine's smiles, it's to reveal something about the character. And yes, I that's such a good point. We cannot really see Bilibin, but we can sort of feel that we know the, the sensation of his massaging or he's making all these faces with his wrinkles, right? So, yes. I, and, and someone also said he's a little bit of, you know, that, this, that kind of description also comes from Dickens, right? Dickens often describes, you know, Dickens characters, he does describe his characters, but his characters are often, often like, you know, can we see them? We can feel that we know them. And of course, you know, Tolstoy was heavily influenced by Dickens. And in fact, I think I, I, I read a wonderful sentence in his biography. And of course he heavily identified with David Copperfield because David Copperfield was an orphan, you know, never met. Uh, his mother, and which was Tolstoy's life story, that right? he he was born, he never met his mother. So he, the the the, the biography. I think there was a good sentence about you know it's David Copperfield teaching Tolstoy not only how to write, but how to look at his own life and finding things worth telling. I find that fascinating. Just you know, we never really now think about Tolstoy and Dickens, but that's how one writer affect or influence another writer, right? Um, I was thinking of both, of you and Ayana, um, mm -hmm. as both writers very much invested in the tangle of, of history. Um, and again, it's there in the first sentence of the very first story you published, Immortality, mm -hmm. which begins, his story as the story of every one of us started long before he was born. Um, mm -hmm. And one of the questions a reader asks in Tolstoy Together is why do we revisit history in fiction? Mm -hmm. um, is it that dictum that history repeats itself? Is it that the writer sees something new through history? Or is it is it something else? Right. Think about that question. Yeah, I, I think you know, I would be so curious what Ayana would say to that. Yeah. And but for myself, I think, you know, there are different ways to answer that question. For myself, it's just how to make sense of the world. You know, I, I think Tolstoy, when he started writing War and Peace, just to use War and Peace as an example, he did not mean to write War and Peace. He meant to write 19, I mean, sorry, 1825 was the, the revolution of Decemberists. He wanted to write, you know, that's, that's, that's his uncle. He's, you know, not... Great, not grandparents, but his, his parents' generation. That's the revolution he wanted to write. So he started to write about 1825. And very soon he realized to enter 1825, he had to go back 20 years earlier. He had to go back to 1805 to understand 1805 to 1812. So speaking of backstories, sometimes we write and we think, oh, you know, we need to insert some backstories. I just love Tolstoy saying, you know, in fact, the backstory is art and novel. Let me just go back to the backstory. And I think there was a reason because he really needed to make sense of Russia and, you know, history and the war and the next generation of revolutionaries. And I think the same reason that's why I am interested in history. I, I like to think about things that take time. I don't know if that makes sense. So, 
Well, I, I mean, I, I just to to give an example, I you know in 1989 I was 16 and I was in Beijing, you know, was the was the Tiananmen Square uh, protest, and I had this childhood friend. She was she's t- she's two years older than me, and so she was 18 and she was a very active activist, college fresh woman. And she went on hunger strike and she was the, sort of the big leader of the students activism and you know the protest i mean i two years younger i look at her i looked up at her as just you know the next generation of revolutionary and if the story or if a book took place in that time frame she would just be an absolute heroine 30 years later when I went back to China a couple of years ago, I was talking to her. She was very patriotic. She was very pro-China. She was very anti, you know, American, anti anything West. Just that the contrast of what 30 years of experience would do to a woman, to me, that is history. You know, you, you have to write history in a way that it takes time to form. So like, I, I so I my thought was, well, this is interesting because if I write about her in that moment, she's less interesting, she's predictable. But 30 years later, she presents herself very unexpectedly as a different kind of person. So, well, I think that's why I'm interested in history. You know, it, history, not just in that moment, but history, how history takes 30 years or 100 years to become something, if that makes sense. Um, that makes me think about the, the, the idea of time passing and how, mm-hmm. how story changes or how history changes. Um, that the group of people who read in, who are contributors to Tulsa together range across generations. We have young readers in their 20s, we have readers in their 80s, and we have everyone in between. And one of the the fascinating threads throughout Tulsi Together are the different perspectives that people have um, about certain certain specific scenes, about motherhood, about marriage, um, also about humor. Mm-hmm. And I was thinking a lot about that, especially today with, with the section that we read today, which is a scene at a party. And I was thinking, I'm so relieved I'm not reading this. I'm not commuting and reading this on the subway because I would have been laughing the entire just the entire time and i wonder if you could talk a little bit about humor in tolstoy because it one of the things that that came up at the start of the book club was how surprised people were and how much they didn't expect to find humor in the novel right you know that's that's so interesting right we we always think i i sometimes i feel tolstoy really gets misrepresented in history i mean partly it was his own fault right he went on to become this person who really just who just wanted to be a guru so that's terrible of him so so we can, we can blame him but but we have to remember one thing is tolstoy was 41 when he finished this novel so he was in his 30s when he started to write this novel i think there are certain moments in your career you're just looking everything with wide open eyes you know you could feel that he was writing about for instance the party so in part of the part of you know pierre so lovely awkward you know represented (laughs) represented tolstoy himself tolstoy was probably just a very bad party person he was very bad at going to party but he did have his cousin, you know, 20 years older than him, who showed, she was, she was probably the Anna Pavlovna. She showed Tolstoy around in Moscow and Petersburg. And she sort of introduced that joy of society to Tolstoy who did not have access to that. So I just thought, you know, one thing that I learned from reading War and Peace is, Tolstoy is probably very boring as a person, but he allowed himself to be more interested in people who are more frivolous than him. You know, I think he allowed himself to be interested in people who are probably more mediocre than him in a way. But because 
he sort of opened that possibility. He realized he actually was writing about these characters with such joy and the fondness. You know, even though he made fun of them, he was not. You know, he 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 had a certain fondness for for the characters who just behaved so idiotically or so flawed. So I don't know. I feel that humor comes from. I do, I'm sure someone better can say that better, but I do think when he writes about people, characters with humor, he's really not looking at them from, you know, a God's point of view. He's looking at them just as Pierre look at these people and say, how oh, interesting. I don't understand them. Yeah. How human, yes. Yes, how human, that is exactly right. Um. So I was I was just grateful to the to the people in Tulsa together who pointed the humor out. Um, so I think we have a time. I might sneak in a couple more questions, and then if there are questions from the audience. Um, so there's an essay in Tulsa together that I'm trying to think how to describe it that translates war and peace into music. For lack of, a, of a better way to describe it, Alain Mazel compares the characters in War and Peace to to Tchaikovsky's music and assigns each of the characters a season, one of Tchaikovsky's seasons. Mm -hmm. And you sometimes connected moments in Tolstoy to childhood memories. Um, I'm trying to think what are some of the other characters in Tolstoy together uh, sort of connected, connected war and peace to sort of different moments from their lives. And I'm just wondering if, as you're reading War and Peace again this year, if different random things or seemingly random things are popping into your head as you read it now? Yes, I, I, I think each reading, I mean, I, I have, let me frame it this way. I feel that I think, I, I think this time when I read War and Peace, I feel that I have, I carry the group of readers from last time. And I carried their voice with me. So sometimes I actually argue with them. Yes. <laughs> sometimes I agree with them. Sometimes I say, oh, yes, you know, you're right. So, well, one thing that I would say I missed in last year, the readers pointed out, this year I think some of the readers pointed out too, is women, when they turn 50, they're considered very old in this novel. And I, I, I'm sure for different reasons, if Natasha, I mean, Natasha's mother got married at 15, right? So by 50, she she's older. And also just the lifespan of the people back then. But it's just, I, I, I think it's interesting. The random thoughts I have is, you know, just thinking about when I was a child, when I was reading War and Peace as a child, or well, people at 50 were very old to me. <laughs> but now I'm, I don't, I don't feel that. I mean, I'm, I'm almost 50. Next year I'll be 50. So I feel that it's, it's my sort of angle changes, but I still, I sort of remembered myself as a reader, as a young reader everything makes sense to me then. Some of the things that make sense to me then do not make sense to me now. So that's that's the sort of things I think in a way, I think reading is sort of like a mirror. You're looking at into the mirror, but it's not yourself, it's your past or, you know, at one moment of your life. So, so I think, you know, just listening to other readers Again, I, I do feel it's the blind spot, you know, it's the other readers reminding me of what I was like when I first started reading this book. And someone said about the confusion of the names. <laughs> I love our friend Wayne Scott said the other day, said sometimes in the middle of the night, I woke up and I worried that I, I wake up and I worry I misspelled a character's name. <laughs> And I just love it so much because to this day, I think there are a lot of characters' names I cannot say. So I just I just have my shortcut for them. You know, for instance, Boris' mother has a long name. It, like she's forever Boris' mother to me because I just can't say the name. So it's just sort of lovely to, to see myself in other readers and to remember myself 
in my past readings from other readers experience. There's a wonderful picture of your copy, of your edition of War and Peace. And every page has one. Yes, there it is. That's <laughs> right. With different notes from different different you know, readings. Yeah. All 15 times now. I think it's 14, 15 times now. 15 times. Yeah. And, and I like to imagine that as you're reading it this time, that you're also starting to annotate your copy of closer together with reactions to your fellow readers. And that you will start to add some little post-it notes to the I, You know, I, I end up using another edition, I mean, another translation, but also I do think that's one, that's a good point, Bridget, because when I read that well annotated uh, copy of one piece, oftentimes I think the conversation became my conversation with myself, with my past readings. So this time I actually have a fresh copy so I can sort of put my fellow readers fingerprints into this copy instead of you know the old copy so it's it's lovely it's a very fun experience one of the other oh, oh, oh so strange. I, I had to come in because i was just like my face when you showed the book i was just like wow oh, yes. <laughs> that is amazing <laughs> well it's getting confusing sometimes and sometimes i cannot there are moments I would look at my annotation and say, what's funny? I don't find it funny. Clearly, <laughs> in one reading, I find it so funny, I would say, ha, ha, ha. So <laughs> uh, we are getting some fantastic questions from the audience. Mm -hmm. So um, if we want to, we can switch up to a few of those. I do want to share a comment as well. Yeah. Uh, Envoy says, thanks for sponsoring this. I'm enjoying listening to their perspectives. Read the book long ago and fairly recently, but this time will be an entirely different experience. And I think that's a great comment. Since you've read it so many times and how you can have such a unique experience each time is really phenomenal. Thank you. Uh, Sandra is asking, can you talk about why Tolstoy changed to the R L-U-R, and us pronouns when writing about the war? That's a very good question. I think, you know, Thomas Kitson, Kitson, who's the translator, I actually called on him yesterday because I did not know how to answer the question. I think several readers last year and several readers this year noticed that when Tolstoy started to write about the war, all of a sudden it's us, ours, it's the French, I mean the Russian, and they is the French armies. But I think I don't have you know a great answer. But early on in the first chapter, she, he also used us. He said, you know, they talk in French. They converse to the characters in the, at the party at the sorry, they talk in the French. Our grandparents spoke. So my guess, one of my guesses is he, you know, Tolstoy was written in a. 1865 around it was serialized in magazines and he had a very specific readers like it's the magazine readers who shared his you know sort of lineage so he said our grandparents he was actually addressing the the readers so i think that's one reason he switched to ours at the beginning and then in during the war it's I mean, it's clearly he was taking the Russian side, which is also understandable. I was thinking, you know, how do you understand that? When I was little, I watched those Chinese uh, movies, war movies about World War II, for instance, or Civil War movies. There was always the introduction to the movie with a huge Mac map. You know, this is the like World War II movies. Um, Casablanca started with a map, you know, the the... the but the, the, the introduction with the map, the narrator always says, our army did this, our army did that. So I think it's sort of like that communal narrator of you know giving you a side right away. That's my guess why Tolstoy started to use that us, ours during the war session. Uh, before we get to the next question, I wanna ask both of you, what it was like, what was your experience like putting this book together? It's so unique. And once people get to look at this book, I think they will like 
see and see what I'm talking about and agree with me that <clears throat> I'm it's a very unique book. It's a very uniquely arranged book. So I'm wondering how much pleasure it was to put something like this together and um, what your own unique experience was with that. I want to say putting the book together is all Bridget's <laughs> brilliance. I, go ahead. But I just thought, even I was surprised when I got the final coffee. I thought, wow, this is so wonderful. It's not only by day, but there are themes and there's a recurrent, you know, sort of, it's like a war and peace, right? The war and peace is one character appears here. Another character will appear here. They echo each other. And I think the book is put together in that there is a theme about party. And later you see, you know, different variation of the same thing or different themes they sort of talk to each other but how she did it how you did it bridget well i think one of the you know we read it at such an unusual time and in such an unusual way and when we decided we were going to do it it really started as a very casual conversation i think we said well what if we read a book together and ian said well why don't we read war and peace because i read it every year and so we didn't really plan a, do a whole lot of planning because we launched it too quickly. Um, and I think that contributed to the kind of conversation that we had. Everybody was participating in their own way. Yes. So you just had this whole cacophony of voices and perspectives. And during the 85 days we were reading War and Peace, we were also meeting this whole other cast of characters who are the contributors to Tolstoy together. And so, you know, we would talk about, you know, if I open up a page at random, John Nealman is, you know, a protagonist in Toasted Together, or Miss Mainwaring is a main character in Toasted Together. And so you were sort of just threading their stories as we put together the story of, of reading this book together. Yeah. And so there were just, would that be a way to say it? There were just these overlapping conversations. Yes, and I, I think also, you know, I was just thinking, because Garth Greenwell said, you know, the other kind of reading together experience would be in the classroom. But in the classroom, oftentimes the professor or, you know, whoever leads in would give a few questions and everybody would follow the same path down and say, let's read War and Peace with historical, you know, something in mind. Or, But here, because there's really, I think, the, the the conversation it's more like it is to me it's like eavesdropping on many people's private conversation when they read Tolstoy when they have conversation with the book and sometimes with each other on Twitter so that private conversation is sort of just organized in in a very lovely way so I I, I think that's probably how I would put it I just want to say one other thing which is was a sort of an, a defining quality of the of this project which was the idea of reading slowly and consistently and the i think somebody described it as the quality of attention that it allowed and hmm. and, and yeah. sort of gave opened up a space for people um, to notice things in, in a way yeah. uh, <clears throat> john says i'm joining this year and ha and i have my copy of war and peace this book and the Twitter feed. It is a great combination. Did you have the encore in mind to support the experience of the three sources? And I guess also if you, I, I don't, I think that we haven't really talked about that this is happening again. <laughs> yes, I think that, you know, I, I think the encore, the reading Tolstoy together encore is partly is I mean, the joy is to have this book next to War and Peace, right? Just to sort of read along and have a conversation with last year and have a conversation with our friends on Twitter. And it's, I, I, I think there's all, there are also conversations like this year that reminds me of the conversation last year. But once again, it's a different kind of, a different group of readers. And sometimes it's just like the minute, change in the direction it just brings out brings on a whole new i don't know just whole new thread for instance yesterday someone said well that constant garnet 
translation is really not popular. Nobody is mentioning Garnet's translation. And I said, well, some of a grad student, grad school friend, Masuki um, Sugi, and she read the Garnet translation in Zizi Packer's seminar. And both Sugi and Zizi Packer came onto Twitter to chime in. And Sugi said, oh, yes, I read the wrong translation. And Zizi Packer said, but I told you to read that translation. And <laughs> it's like, it's a mini play on the side conversation, but it's really about how are we reading book? And this lovely reader said, well, the reason I'm reading Garnet is that's the only translation available in my library and nobody has checked it out for years and years. <laughs> <laughs> I just love imagining that poor book, right? It's just being in the library and nobody is checking the book out. But so someone said, well, I am enjoying Garnet translation. So I think, you know, we talk about translation last year too, but here we have really people just talking about translation in, in such a, not a scholastic way, but it's just like a very friendly, sort of companionly way. It's just very lovely. It feels to me the translations are alive instead of just dead translations in the library, if that makes sense. Um, I'm curious, since this is a world experience, or since it could be a world experience, <clears throat> Do you have anyone in either the new re the new reading or in the first one um, reading it in the original Russian? There, last year, I think there was one reader reading in Russian, one reader reading in Bulgarian. <laughs> he said he could understand he could understand a little Russian. This year, we definitely have one reader who said last year she read in English with us. So this year she decided to read in Russian. It's not just wonderful. We have one reader who read the Chinese translation. I just saw this friend on Twitter and he or she said, you know, he or she read 20 years ago in Chinese, did not remember anything, did not get anything. But now I think he or she is reading English translation and pointing out all these beautiful passages. And we have Japanese translation last year, and Korean, and right Portuguese. I think someone in somebody was reading in Brazil. Oh, uh, there was there were actually a big group of readers in Brazil last year reading it with us, and the Brazilian newspaper did something about us. <laughs> <laughs> so that's why we know we have a group of Australian readers. I was going to say, if for, if anybody is in the audience who is feeling that they wish they had they hadn't missed the beginning of this and it's not too late to join us. We Last year there were a group of Australians that I think joined about halfway through and um, I, they somehow managed to catch up and I believe several bottles of wine may have been involved but <laughs> it was wonderful to have, to sort of have people come in all the way through. Yeah. Um, so I think this is the time that I confess that I have not ever read War and Peace. And I think that I will be trying to correct that soon. And hopefully, maybe I'll even join the group. I think that sounds like a delightful thing to do. Because um, you made it, like, it's such a tome. And it's always been one of those things that I'm just like, Ugh, when am I going to have the time? <laughs> and you make it seem like... This is a, a completely doable task. This is well, maybe not even a task. It's a it's a doable project. It's it's something that can be enjoyed, and um, I think you've given me a lot of inspiration. So you are not late at all. We're only on day fifteen. Right. So that's oh, <laughs> yeah, that's fine. I'll yeah. pick up my copy tomorrow at Left Bank. I'll see you next week. Excellent. <laughs> I'm not on Twitter though, so I don't know what that. I don't know how that'll work. Um, all right, Lisa says greetings from the foothills of Orange County. Even I am behind. I teach full time at community college. I am loving it and so grateful. And it must be really fantastic to have this entire community of people reach out to you and be able to share this experience. So I'm 
amazed. I yes, thank you, Lisa. And I really want to say it's not it's never going to be late or you know, it's just we are all just taking our 15 pages or half an hour. But I one thing I want to say, you know, it's just the texture of reading together. It's not only about Tolstoy, it's also about where people read. You know, last year we had people reading at cocktail hour, you know, showing a picture of a glass of wine. We have people reading with their coffee. The other day, someone who's so lovely, I don't know if it's Lisa last time, last last week, someone said she had a full teaching day and it was it was pouring rain. So she went to the, the teacher's parking lot. She said so she read that day's pages just inside the car while the rain was outside. And and that day, we also just had a stormy day in the novel. I just thought it's so lovely for us to hear these textures of where and when and how people read. And we're also reading together. Sort of, it really just brought for myself, I thought was, I was so grateful when I saw that tweet. I thought it just broadens my sort of daily experience. You know, I can see people in the world. I can feel people in the world reading. Uh, Lisa says, I'm telling my students about it as a model of engagement. They are impressed and inspired. And yes, the texture and exclamation point. Uh, Anne says, I wasn't on Twitter until I got involved in a public space together to read Turn of the Screw. <laughs> yes. Bridget, do you want to just comment on APS together? Well, sure. I mean, we. I think that this experience of reading War and Peace with Eun and the way that she, the model she gave for this way of reading became, last year became an, I mean, very much an anchor for, for many readers um, and something that we was important and we wanted to continue doing. So we have continued to host book clubs with different hosts and read everything from Turn of the Screw with Garth Greenwell to um, Machado de Assis with Larry Roker to uh, what Jim Allen McPherson, Jane Bowles, Muriel Spark, um, and a whole host of others. And I was just, I was laughing uh, in appreciation at a number of people who joined Twitter to participate in these book clubs. Um, and one person said, I, I initially joined Tulsa together to practice my tweeting skills. <laughs> <laughs> I also love when you see someone just follows on Twitter, you know, Tim Cook in a public space. <laughs> and you know that person is here just for Tolstoy together. Yeah. All right. We have uh, several other fantastic comments from readers that I will share with you uh, after we conclude. Um, but really, I'm so thankful for both of you. Um, I did hear from Ayanna. Everything is okay. There was just some confusion. Um, so would have loved to have had her involved uh, this evening. Um, but I'm so happy that we were able to have this conversation with you. It was brilliant, inspiring, just all around, just what I love from these virtual events. So I can't thank you both enough. Thank you so much, Shane. Yes, thank you, Shane. And thank you, Leon. And thank you, everyone. Who and joined thank you, us. everyone, for joining us tonight. And hey. I, feel, I feel was here in spirit. So um, thank you to Ayana, too. Yes. And when Ayana's novel comes out, we can do this again. Yep. <laughs> yes. <laughs> I'm looking forward to that day. Um, I want to remind the audience, A, thank you so much for coming. It has been a pleasure having you this evening. Um, I shared links for, I'm going to share this one again. Um, it has a lot of your books and it has uh, Tolstoy Together, which is absolutely beautiful. Uh, it lists Ayanna's book, which is on our shelves as well. Um, I shared a link for one of the versions of War and Peace that we have on our shelves. So if you do want to join the reading group, we have everything that you need except for Twitter. Um, I mean, we have that, but you can't use ours. Um, but have a great rest of your evening. Buy this book. Enjoy the experience of reading Tolstoy together. Thank you. Thank you so much. Good night, everyone.